What's that, Mr. Subaraya? You want me to be in the next Godzilla movie? It's no secret that I love Godzilla movies, but if there's one thing I love more than Godzilla movies, it's freaking Godzilla himself. Godzilla is my inspiration. Why? asks the audience. Well, it's really quite simple, because Godzilla is always full of surprises, and even when the chips are down, he never gives up. And that, to me, is truly inspirational. Oh, what's that? A giant monster made out of smog is hellbent on polluting the Earth and all of a sudden becomes airborne to make his escape? <laughs> yeah, well, he ain't getting very far. Why? Because Godzilla turns himself into a freaking rocket ship and gives chase! Oh my god, what? Say that again? A giant insect god is sent out by an underground civilization to wreak havoc on the people of Earth, and Godzilla, along with his <laughs> robot pal, are unable to stop it because the same old moves just aren't cutting it? Piss on that, says Godzilla, as he reaches into his bag of tricks and unleashes a move that freaking defies gravity! How do he do that? Yo, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Let me get this straight. A bunch of scummy ass space apes sent a freaking robot Godzilla to Earth, disguised as the real Godzilla, to take over the world and tarnish Godzilla's good name? Yeah, no. Off with that bitch's head, Godzilla shouts as he lays the smackdown on this rusty-ass metallic creep. Oh my god! <laughs> now, on top of all that, he's a good-ass dad, he's good at sports, he eats his vegetables, and he can freaking dance. Question, is there anything Godzilla can't do? Answer! Alex, are you okay? Yeah, I just... Oh. Jeez! Godzilla movies are pretty freaking exciting. They're also pretty sensational and just ridiculous in the best ways possible. The dancing, kung fu fighting, alien stomping Godzilla and the more outlandish over-the-top outings seems to capture the majority of the general public's perception of Godzilla. But what some people don't know is that the series didn't start out that way. Godzilla's inception came from a very dark and unfortunately very real place. Godzilla, baptized in the fire of the H-bomb stood in as a metaphor for the horrors that Japan endured during World War II. As years went on, the movies would continue to have underlying messages to them, with Godzilla constantly evolving, being made to fit whatever role the story would call for. From destroyer of worlds, to hero and defender of Earth, Godzilla's freaking done it all, man! There's just, there's just this universal appeal there, which is why I feel like I, along with thousands upon thousands of other people across the world, continue to stick around, and why the franchise continues to draw in and captivate audiences of all ages, 60 plus odd years later. If you're someone that's interested in checking out this franchise but don't exactly know where to start, then these episodes are for you! I'm Alexander the Swell, and this is Nerdy Nummy- Monster Mash. Shit. So over the years, I've had some people find out that I'm into Godzilla, and then they'll ask me, Alex, can you stop flexing your rippling calves? You're putting us all to shame! To which I reply, no! And then they say, oh, okay, well, can you at least recommend us some Godzilla movies? I want to check that shit out! And what I find out is that my answer is kind of all over the place. There's not really one concrete answer that I give people. And I think that's because recommending Godzilla movies is kind of tricky. Given that there's so many different movies, and a lot of them are so radically different from each other, both in style and overall tone, I could recommend a movie like Godzilla vs. Hedorah, for example. A movie that kind of has Godzilla fans split down the middle, they either love it or they hate it. See, I love it. 
But my reasons for loving it could very well be reasons that other people hate it. But that one in particular, I love it because it's just, it's so weird and, and so trippy and it's just like, what even is this movie? Like, what? Fish faces? What is this? What is this Muppety ass bullshit? I love that stuff, but that might not be somebody else's bag. They could watch it based on my recommendation and then be all, what? This is Godzilla? This is what this guy is so obsessed with? What? And then be completely put off by it, even though there might be another Godzilla movie out there that fits their tastes a bit more. At some point, I plan on reviewing all the Godzilla movies. That could be a good way for people to decide which movies to check out, you know, since the reviews will be detailed enough for people to see what catches their interest, but some people might not want to sit through 30 plus something reviews. That's why I feel the best thing to do is to maybe go into the different types of Godzilla movies, you know, and, and categorizing them in such a way that people can see, you know, what catches their interest, what tickles their fancies, and a much more condensed video that's not like 30 plus something videos. Given that there's so many different versions and, and interpretations of Godzilla, it's attracted a lot of different types of audiences within the Godzilla fan base, and they have so many different opinions on what Godzilla should be. Look at a character like Batman, for example. There's been so many different interpretations over the years, and it seems like everyone has their definitive Batman. Some might prefer the more dark or gothic tone, while others prefer the more lighthearted and campy 1966 Adam West Batman. And then you'll have the people that just completely detest the latter. Well, it's kind of the same thing with Godzilla. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that all the movies have a little bit of a camp factor to them. Some more than others, but when the premise of most of these movies is a giant dinosaur fighting another giant dinosaur or a bug or a robot, you know, things things are, they tend to be a little silly, you know? I mean, even the original Godzilla movie has a little bit of that, and that one's regarded as a classic. Now, I know a lot of veteran Godzilla fans might be freaking out right now, like, oh, that is sacred grounds, you know? But don't worry, I'm not knocking on the movie, I have nothing but respect for it, I love the movie, I think it's fantastic, you know, and I agree with the sentiments that it's a classic. But it does have its fair share of unintentionally silly moments, you know, particularly with the puppet that they use in some of the shots. But, but it's just a little bit, just, just a wee. Now some of the movies completely stand out from the rest and have kind of interesting tidbits that I feel newcomers should know before going into them, and I'll highlight those in this video. I'll also share what the general consensus is within the Godzilla fan base, and even though I said I wouldn't give my own personal picks, I'll chime in with my own feedback as well. And everyone's different, so if I describe something that sounds like something you might be into, but I mention that I don't particularly care for it, you know, don't let that detract you from either checking it out, or on the opposite end, completely skipping it altogether. And at the end of the series, I'll briefly get into how you can seek out these movies if you're interested, whether it's through home video, like DVD, Blu-ray, and video streaming services. And with all that said, let's begin! But first we do Kung Fu! So all the Godzilla movies that came out before the 2014 American Godzilla by Legendary, with the exception of the other American Godzilla movie from 1998 by Tristar, they're all separated into three different eras. You got the Showa era, which ran from 1954 through 1975, beginning with the original Godzilla, ending with Terror of Mechagodzilla. The Heisei era, which started with Godzilla 1984 and ended with Godzilla vs. Destroyer from 1995. And then lastly, the Millennium series, which started in 1999 and wrapped up in 2004, beginning with Godzilla 2000 Millennium and ending with Godzilla Final Wars. Now the two American movies that I mentioned don't necessarily fall under any of those specific eras, they're kind of categorized under their own thing. This is mainly for the original 28 movies that were produced by Toho, the company that created and owns Godzilla. Now the Showa series, that's the one that I feel has the most variety to it, and it's my personal favorite. There are various different tones throughout the movies, and various levels of quality as well. The original movie, like I mentioned in the opening of this episode, has a very dark and just somber tone to it. There's nothing here that's played for laughs. They, they take it very seriously. I mean, you can compare the original to the later Showa movies, and it's like they're not even from the same series. The American version of the original movie was released two years later under the name Godzilla King of the Monsters. They added new scenes with American actor Raymond Burr to make the movie feel a little more in line with the American monster movies that were coming out at the time. And despite playing down the nuclear commentary that the original had, it still has a presence in this movie and it's still pretty effective. Now the first sequel, Godzilla Raids Again, also known as Gigantus the Fire Monster in North America, this was the movie that made Godzilla into a franchise, and it was also the first one that had him go up against another monster, something that would become a staple of the franchise, and a little more fine-tuned with the next movie, King Kong vs. Godzilla. This was the movie that kind of ironed out the formula a little bit more, and it was also where the series started showing early signs of having a little bit of a tonal shift. 
It was a lot more lighthearted than the first two entries, and it even had a lot of comedic elements in it, especially with the Japanese version, with a lot of moments playing it out like a straight up comedy. King Kong getting drunk off his hairy ass on some friggin' berry juice after fighting an actual octopus, then using electricity powers for some reason, they got Zilla falling for Looney Tunes ass traps and, and dancing around. fun, some crazy crap, but surprisingly, this was kind of tame compared to what would come later. I mean, this is only the tip of the iceberg. 1964 saw the release of two Godzilla movies, Mothra vs. Godzilla and Ghidorah, the three-headed monster. It was at this point that the series was in full throttle. And for a lot of fans, these two movies, along with the next one that followed, Invasion of Astro Monster, also known as Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, or just Monster Zero, are considered by some fans to not only be where the Showa series peaked, but where the franchise in general did. By introducing characters like Mothra and Ghidorah, the series was starting to have a lot of mythical elements to it, as well as having a heavier emphasis on sci-fi, what with the space travel and aliens and shit, the latter being something that also became kind of a trope in later Godzilla movies to come. And believe it or not, the monsters were starting to have a little bit more personality at this point. You know, something that would remain for the rest of the Showa series. And by throwing in characters like Mothra and Rodan, Toho was kind of establishing their own cinematic universe, if you will. These two characters appeared in their own standalone movies before being placed into the Godzilla series, and that's something that's a common occurrence nowadays, thanks to the Marvel Studios movies. But freaking Toho, man, they were ahead of the curve! You know, these monsters, they're the OG Avengers, son! Now, saying that the franchise peaked with Invasion of Astro Monster, in my opinion, is a little bit of a stretch. However, I can kind of understand why people would say that in regards to the Showa series specifically. After Invasion of Astro Monster, they followed up with Ebera, Horror of the Deep, also known as Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. And while it's a movie that I personally like, I can kind of see how it could be considered as a little bit of a step backwards. You go from Godzilla fighting a giant three-headed dragon in space to a freaking lobster! Or a, a shrimp, or, or prawn, whatever the hell he is. Hey man, not knocking on Ebira or anything, but this movie just doesn't feel like it has the same scope that the last ones did. The last couple movies kind of felt like they were building up, you know, like they had a bit of a progression to them, getting larger and larger in scope. This one just, by comparison, feels a little bit disjointed. First off, the movie was originally written for King Kong, but Godzilla was changed at the last minute. And some of the elements of the story didn't even change, despite swapping King Kong for Godzilla, so what you end up with is Godzilla kind of showing some uncharacteristic traits. I mean, for one, he kind of has an interest in a woman, something that's synonymous with Kong, and that only further adds to the movie feeling just slightly disjointed. Not only that, but there was a little bit of a drop in quality, mostly with the visuals. This was the first movie not to have the original special effects supervisor, Godzilla co-creator Eiji Tsuburaya. Even though he was apparently supervising the effects, you could tell that there was a slight decline. And the movie after that, Son of Godzilla, took a way different turn. I mean, it did a total 180, and it was more than the stark contrast between King Kong vs. Godzilla and the original Godzilla. This was the point in the series where you could really tell they were trying to gear it towards kids. A year later, though, it seems like they got a little bit more on track with Destroy All Monsters. Originally, this was supposed to be the last Godzilla movie, so they weren't farting around anymore. They brought back Eiji Tsuburaya for the special effects, Akira Fukube, the original composer, Ishiro Honda, the director of the original Godzilla, as well as movies from 1962 through 1965, and Tomoyuki Tanaka, producer and co-creator of Godzilla. I mean, they made this thing a freaking free-for-all, throwing in most of the characters that they had in a lot of the Toho movies. I mean, it was nuts. The movie itself is not necessarily one of my favorites, but it has a great premise, and it definitely seems like a step up after Invasion of Astro Monster. That, and it was the last movie to have the original Dream Team working on it, you know? It would have really made for a great send-off. But, plans changed, and they decided to keep going. Now, it's at this point that the series was kind of starting to have a little bit of a nosedive in terms of quality, depending on how you look at it. And the way I see it, it's also the point where it's starting to show signs of identity crisis, for lack of a better word. The first movie out the gate was All Monsters Attack, more infamously known as Godzilla's Revenge. This one was a straight up kids movie, and it was probably the most radical departure the series has taken yet, with most of the movie taking place in a real world, with a lot of the Godzilla shit happening inside of a kid's head, and it relied really heavy on stock footage. I mean, that's something that even the earlier movies had, but it was way more apparent in the show of movies after Destroy All Monsters, and way more poorly executed too. Now, these are the movies where Godzilla was starting to shift from being an antagonist to pretty much a straight-up superhero. 
And as the movies progressed, the tone was really starting to fluctuate. Godzilla's Revenge was extremely kid-friendly, what with Godzilla's dumbass son talking and shit. I got no friends. But then the very next movie, Godzilla vs. Hedorah, also known as Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, incorporated some horror elements to it, and then some creepy imagery. Godzilla vs. Gigan had a bit of gore, and Godzilla vs. Megalon had people in togas and size-changing robots. Okay, that's pretty cool. And Terra Mecha Godzilla had boobs! I mean, after Destroy All Monsters, the series really went off the rails. And it was pretty clear that the quality dropped significantly. Yet, some of these movies are actually considered fan favorites. Again, in the end, it's all about preference. Despite these movies being lower in quality, a lot of fans find things that are redeemable about them. I mean, they introduce some great characters to the series, they have great soundtracks, but above all else, they're just stupid fun. A lot of fans were actually introduced to Godzilla through the 70s movies, myself included. With movies like Godzilla vs. Megalon being one of the more common ones, especially with older fans. Those are the ones that would play on TV a lot, and were more commonly available on VHS. Now the way I see it, all Godzilla movies, even the ones that are technically bad, uh, they're still a fun time. Unless it's Godzilla Raids again. That movie is just... <sighs> like, I get that it's historically significant when it comes to the series, but... I don't know, man. That one's just... <clears throat> oh, God! My ulcer. Now, I gotta go water my crops. So we're gonna take a little bit of a break. When I come back, we're gonna wrap things up with the Heisei series, the Millennium series, and then briefly talk about how you can find these movies. I'm telling you, homie peeps, fun times are... Oh, my God! What? What is... What even is that? What? <laughs> Hey, where's the big flashy banner? That's all we got.